Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Sabbath services, the Sabbath before the Passover. And the Passover was the key fundamental fulcrum of the plan of God working out on the earth as he has proposed. And so today we are going to cover 28 prophecies that were fulfilled just before or on or just after the Passover day. Now we know from Revelation 13 and verse 8, it says that Christ was crucified from the beginning of the world. And that is true. We have this in 2 Timothy, the first chapter. Now this is important because we're looking at something here that God has proposed, that God has planned, that he is carrying out and working it all out according to the counsel of his will through his creation, through his angels, through mankind, and everything that there is. So when we come to 2 Timothy, the first chapter, we find this, and it's really important for us to grasp it, because God has brought us into something that he planned before the ages of time. Now let's pick it up here. Verse 9, 2 Timothy, the first chapter. And it's interesting that this is not written of any place else except here and in Titus, the first chapter. Not written exactly as it is here. But you see, in the span of time, the way God looks at it, it's entirely different than the way we look at it. But this tells us something. What we are doing is not a religious practice. What we are doing and reading about is something that God has planned and God has revealed and he's revealed it through his word and he's revealed it through his creation. So verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Now think about that. God himself through Jesus Christ has called each and every one of us us. Now, I want you to think about how important that is to you and to God. And compare that with the rest of the world. And that makes it a very humbling thing indeed that who are we that God would call us? And who are we that he would reveal his truth to us? And who are we that we're able to receive the Holy Spirit of God and understand the Word of God? That is an absolute marvelous and miraculous thing that God has done for us. Okay? Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. And that's what the Passover is all about which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages of time. Now, that's very hard for us to fathom. But God has his plan that he's working out. And the central focus of that plan begins and ends with Jesus Christ begins with the Passover and ends with the completion of the age and the beginning of the new heavens and the earth, which then is a new beginning. So you see, what God has called us to is not a religion to be good people in the world, but he has called us to a life of growing and overcoming and loving him and 
Christ and the Father dwelling in us and loving us and helping us to attain to the goal that God wants us to. Okay? Now then, as we will see, the prophecies of Christ's coming came right at the beginning. Now, if you have the book, The Day Jesus the Christ Died, well, you go ahead and get it. Just go ahead and put this on pause and go get it and turn to page 35 because we're going to go through, and this will have all the scriptures right in front of us so that we don't have to turn to the Old Testament and turn to the New Testament and turn to the Old Testament and turn to the New Testament. And this will help us be able to concentrate more. So if you don't have the day that Jesus the Christ died, then get the harmony of the Gospels, and it begins on page 268. So go ahead and take the time and find it, and so you can come come to the place that we have for the 28 prophecies fulfilled on the crucifixion day, and that means the prophecies that are just before and just after. Now it's amazing, because if anyone wants proof that the Old Testament is true, and that the New Testament is the fulfilling of it, and together they represent the complete word of God. And within it, it contains the complete plan of God as revealed by his Sabbath and his holy days. Now, the Passover becomes the fulcrum between the two, but the two are one. So let's begin with the very first one, the first prophecy, oldest of all, okay, had been given by the Lord himself because he knew what was going to happen because of the sin of Adam and Eve, okay, and here's what was prophesied. Number one, the serpent would bruise the seed of the woman. Now we find this in Genesis 3 and verse 15. And I will put enmity between you, Satan, and that's the battle that it has been all down through time, and the woman, which then is the church, and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your heel, and you shall bruise his head, Genesis 3.15. Okay. Now then, here's what Jesus said on the Passover night after he had given the symbols of the bread and wine for the new covenant. And this is found in John 12, verses 31 through 33. Jesus said on that Passover night, because of the Passover and what was coming. And they were on their way to go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay. He said, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. But Jesus had to die and not sin. But if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to myself, showing that everything in the plan of God had to center around the Passover. That's past, present, and future. But he said this to signify by what death he was about to die. Okay? Now, let's come to prophecy number two. And it is this, that the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. And this was prophesied by Daniel in the 70 weeks prophecy. 
So we find in Daniel 9, and after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. At Daniel 9, 26. Now we find this fulfilled in John 11. Here was a prophecy given by the high priest Caiaphas that one would die for the nation. Now this was sometime before the Passover. So Caiaphas told the Sanhedrin when they were trying to figure out, well, what are we going to do with Jesus? Because everybody's following him. So here from John 11, verses 50 to 52, we have this. He said, nor consider that it is better for us that one man die for the people than that the whole nation should perish. Now, he did not say this of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, see. And he didn't understand that it was also for the whole world but not for the nation only, but also that he might gather together into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So that's quite a thing. See, Every word we will see concerning the Passover, and the sacrifice of Christ, was fulfilled as prophesied. Prophecy number three, the betrayal of Jesus by Judas is foretold by David, prophesied. Even a man, my friend in whom I trusted, who ate it of my bread is lifted up his heel against me, Psalm 41 and verse 9. Now what we're also going to see, that all of these prophecies are scattered a little here, a little there, a line here, a line there, precept here, a precept there, and it's put all together. And they all came together on the Passover day. So here's the fulfillment of that. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest in order that he might deliver him up to them. And after hearing this, they were delighted and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Mark 14, verses 10 and 11. It's not interesting. Prophesied all the way back, okay, during the days of David. So prophecy number three was the betrayal of Jesus by Judas Iscariot. Prophecy number four, Jesus Christ would be forsaken by his disciples as prophesied by Zechariah. Now you see, just exactly like I said, a little here, a little there. So here's the prophecy from Zechariah 13 and verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts, strike the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. Well, that's what happened when Jesus was arrested. At midnight, during the power of darkness of Satan the devil, in arresting Jesus. Okay. Fulfilled. Then they all forsook him and fled. Well, that's quite a thing. See? They all ran away. Now, let's come to number five. Okay. The price of his betrayal was foretold by Zechariah. Prophesied. And I said to them, if it is good, give me my price, and if not, let go. So they weighed my price, 30 pieces of silver. 
Zechariah 11 and verse 12. Now, when you go to the, to the law and find out another scripture where this came from, it came from the one that said that a dead slave was worth 30 pieces of silver. And that was in the judgment when someone would cause the death of someone else's slave. So here it is concerning Jesus, fulfilled. And he said, what are you willing to give me? That is Judas. He went to the priest and said, huh, what are you willing to forgive me? And I will deliver him up to you. And they offered him 30 pieces of silver, Matthew 26, 15. Amazing. Not 29, not 31, but 30. Now the priest who offered Judah 30 pieces of silver didn't know about this prophecy. But there they were, fulfilling these prophecies. So this shows you, just exactly like Jesus said, I'm the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. Now then, we can also suppose that there were many, many angels over Jerusalem that Passover and crucifixion day, causing all of these things to be fulfilled. As a matter of fact, you get the harmony of the Gospels and you start out six days before the Passover, okay? And you follow that through. Every one of those things had to also be inspired by the angels to bring to pass all the prophecies when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. There were large crowds. Well, who do you suppose inspired them to go so they would be there? Probably the angels, all right? So that's prophecy number five, betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Prophecy number six, Zechariah also foretold what would be done with the betrayal money. Huh, isn't that something? You might think a small little detail, but the smallest little detail of prophecy we need to understand will be fulfilled. And this is the most important event from the creation of the world, the Passover day in which Christ died. Okay, so this is prophecy number six foretold by Zechariah. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the princely price at which I was valued by them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Now think about that, even where these 30 pieces of silver would be thrown. Fulfilled. Now when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he was condemned, he changed his mind and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elder, saying, I have sinned, I have betrayed innocent blood. But that was too late. But they said, what is that to us? You see it to yourself. Well, and after throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he went out and hanged himself. Now then, here's another part of the prophecy. By a potter's field, okay? But the chief priest took the pieces of silver and said, now notice the hypocrisy of them. They gave the money to Judas to betray Jesus so they could execute him. And then he brought the money back and notice what they said. It is not lawful to put them, that is 30 pieces of silver, 
into the treasury since it is the price of blood. Not thinking, what about your planning to murder him and crucify him for how long? Okay. And after taking counsel, they bought a potter's field with the pieces of silver for a burial ground for strangers. Matthew 27, verses 3 through 7. All right. And that also was still the price and the name of it when the apostles got together on Pentecost to select who would be the one to replace Judas Iscariot, who had fallen. All right? So that prophecy number six foretold what would be done with the betrayal money. Prophecy number seven. Isaiah prophesied that Jesus Christ would be sacrificed as the Passover lamb of God. Now, we also find this. Isaiah has more prophecies concerning more things than any of the other prophets in the Bible. He's got about the Passover. He's got about the first coming, the second coming. He has about the millennium. He has about New Jerusalem, all of that. So Isaiah was really... Tremendously important, okay? So here's the prophecy. Isaiah prophesied he would be sacrificed as the Passover lamb. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Isaiah 53 and verse 7. And we will find this. In Isaiah 53, there were a number of prophecies in that chapter specifically relating to the death and crucifixion of Jesus Christ as payment for sin. We'll see that as we go along here. Okay. So here's the prophecy. Isaiah 53 and verse 7, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, fulfilled. For Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. Then continuing on in 1 Peter, knowing that you were not redeemed by corruptible things, but by the precious blood of Christ. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who truly was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last days for your sakes. 1 Peter 1 verses 18 through 20. Okay. So God revealed to the apostles what to write about the very days and the events that happened, and they saw them with their own eyes. Okay. They were the eyewitnesses. Now then, that's, that's number seven. Okay. Prophecy number eight. Isaiah also prophesied the scourging and mocking that he would suffer. And he did. Okay. Prophesied. I will give my back to the smiters, that is the scourgers, the one who beat him nearly to death. And my cheeks to them that pluck off the hair, pulling off out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Isaiah 50 and verse 6. And to this day, the Jews do not understand these scriptures. Some of them do, but most of them don't. So here's the fulfillment of this prophecy. Then he released, that is, Pontius Pilate released Barabbas, okay, then he released Barabbas to them, but after scourging Jesus, he delivered him up so that he might be crucified. Now, the cross of crucifixion is not like you see in most movies. The cross of crucifixion was a big tree 
trimmed down and they put iron flanges into the trunk of the tree. And those iron flanges then would hold the crossbar so that they could crucify many people by crucifying their hands on the crossbar and then lifting them up and putting that crossbar in those flanges. And so that's why it is called a cross and it is called a tree. Both are correct. So here's the fulfillment. Then he, Pilate, released Bar Barabbas to them, and after scourging him, he delivered him up so he might be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers, after taking Jesus with them into the praetorium, gathered the entire band against him, and they stripped him and put on a scarlet cloak around him, and after plating a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a rod in his right hand and bowing the knees before him. They mocked him and kept on saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Now look at what Jesus went through. And he didn't fight back. He didn't say a single word in his own defense. He did answer a couple of questions to Pilate, but that was it. And they kept on saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then after spitting on him, they took the rod and struck him on the head. That's Matthew 27, verses 26 through 30. Okay. Now, I don't imagine they just gently tapped him on the head. They smacked him on the head. So you see, he was beaten from head to toe, front to back. Now, we will see that both Isaiah and David in the psalm prophesied of how Jesus would be beaten and astonished at how much he was mutilated. Okay, prophecy number nine. Both Isaiah and David prophesied that Jesus' body would be mutilated. Prophesied. Many were astonished at him for his body was so disfigured, even his form beyond that of the sons of men, Isaiah 52 and verse 14. So scourging was really a terrible thing. Then David said this, the very words of Jesus Christ while he hung on the cross. He looked down and he saw his ribs. I count all my bones. They look and gloat over me. Psalm 22, verse 17. And everyone was out there making fun of him. See? Now, I want all of us to keep this in mind as we come to the Passover this coming Tuesday night. Okay? So here's the fulfillment of it. But after scourging Jesus, they delivered him up so that he might be crucified. Matthew 27, 26. Then Pilate, therefore, took Jesus and scourged him, John 19 and verse 1. See how all of those prophecies come together. Now, this is also quite a very interesting thing indeed from this point of view. Sometimes we are going along trying to analyze prophecies as we think they're happening, but lots of times God bunches up all the prophecies, and they're fulfilled in one day. So this is what we have here. Prophecy number 10. David prophesied to shame and dishonor that Jesus would suffer being condemned as a criminal. He'd done no wrong. He committed no sin. 
Now think about that. Think about Jesus' sacrifice covering the sin of everyone who has been falsely charged, convicted, and executed. Down through history. Okay? So here's what the prophecy was. Prophesied, the reproaches of those who reproached you have fallen upon me. And to me is Christ. You have known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My enemies are all before me. See, because Jesus carried in his body the law of sin and death, and that's how he carried our sins to the cross, to the tree. And it's very interesting how all of this occurred. Quite a thing indeed. The creator of mankind dying by the hands of his creation to save his creation from Satan, the devil, and their own sins. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness, and I look for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. He had to do it all alone with no one there to give him any comfort. Fulfilled. At that point, Jesus said to the crowd, have you come out to take me with swords and clubs as against a robber? Matthew twenty six fifty five. He is deserving of death in spite of the fact that Pilate said, I find no fault in him. See? Prophecy number 11. David also foretold that false witnesses would testify against him. Aren't you upset when someone says something false against you? Well, think about everything false that was said about Jesus. They even said he was a Baalzebub, chief of the demons. Of course he wasn't. And everybody in their lifetime will be accused of something that is absolutely not true. And you might not even have an opportunity to explain the truth. Well, that's exactly what it was with Jesus. Prophecy number 11. David also foretold that false witnesses would testify against Christ prophesied. Cruel witnesses rose up. They asked me of things that I knew nothing about. Psalm 35 and verse 11. Fulfilled. And then the chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin were trying to find testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they did not find any. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. And some rose up and bore false witness against him. We find this in Mark 14, verses 55 through 57. Look at how many trials down through history. What would we say? 20%, 30% were all against people who were innocent of any crime. What crime did Jesus commit? None. But he was against the establishment. And the establishment was controlled by whom? Satan, the devil. That's what Jesus said in John the 8th chapter. Okay. Now, prophecy number 12. Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would not make an effort to defend himself at the trial. Prophesied, all right? He was oppressed 
and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. It's amazing. What's going to happen when we meet with the same fate in the future? What are we going to do? Are we going to be a good witness? And when they bring all of these things against us, and we know they're wrong, and we can't say a thing, well, we'll trust in Christ. We'll pray quietly to ourselves and ask God to help us and strengthen us so that we can go through this trial, all right? Continuing now, he has brought his uh, lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shearer is dumb, so he opened on his mouth, Isaiah 53 and verse 7. Okay? Now, fulfilled. Let's see. Think about these prophecies down to the very words fulfilled. So we need to remember that with the word of God. The word of God is righteous. The word of God is true. The word of God never fails. And we find this with the 28 prophecies fulfilled just before, on, or just after the Passover day. So here's the fulfillment of that. Uh, prophecy number 12, fulfilled. Then Pilate said to him, don't you see how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer even one word to him. Huh. And remember how amazed that Pilate was that he wouldn't say anything. Okay? So that the governor was greatly amazed. Matthew 27, verses 13 through 14. Okay? Now, we're going to see the next one, prophecy number 13. And this is quite a long one and a very detailed fulfillment of it. The prophecy is long and the fulfillment of it is long as we will see when we come to this one. Prophecy number 13. Isaiah foretold Jesus Christ's crucifixion as the sin offering for the world. Prophesied. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our sorrows. And all the people in the world don't know that, but they'll, they'll know it one day somewhere along the line. Yet we esteemed him smitten, stricken of God, and afflicted, Yes, they said, well, he's getting it because he deserved it, but he didn't. But he was wounded for our transgressions. So think about that. When you read about the stripes, when you read about the scourging, that was so we could have our sins forgiven. And he took it upon himself, as we find there in John the 10th chapter. He said, no one takes my life from me. But I lay it down, and I have commandment from the Father to receive it back. Now, that's the kind of faith that we need to have in the days we're living with all the prophecies being fulfilled on the right hand and left hand around us all the time. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed. For our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we ourselves are healed. There can't be any healing of sin without the shedding of blood and the sacrifice of Christ. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Now, why would God do that? Well, because the one who created man and woman was the one who became Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, his life as God manifested in the flesh 
covers the sin of all human beings, past, present, and future, because he made all the process genes and chromosomes and put them in Adam and Eve, and it went down from there through all history, through all mankind. So he was the one who was responsible. He was the one who gave the judgment to Adam and Eve because of their sins. So he said, I will take those upon myself so that the plan of God can be fulfilled. Continuing now, yet the Lord willed to crush him and put him to grief. You shall make his life an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days through the power of the resurrection. And that the purpose of the Lord might prosper at his hand. Now that's very interesting. You might do a word study on purpose. See what it has to say about the purpose of God. And we know this, that the purpose of God is manifest in his word and revealed by his Sabbath and holy days. And that's a key important thing. See, Then you add in to that the power of the Holy Spirit within each one of us and the power of the Holy Spirit to lead us, okay? He shall prolong his days through the resurrection, we know. Purpose of the Lord might prosper in his hands. He shall see the travail of his soul. He shall be fully satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many and shall bear their iniquities. Now, that's the prophecy. Now, let's look at the fulfillment of that. Now, you think about all the details that are contained in every one of these prophecies, and then you start asking the question, could these things have happened by chance? Well, no. There are no odds that can tell us that. See? Because God gave these things hundreds of years, and in the case of Adam and Eve, thousands of years, and in the case of Abraham, thousands of years before they ever took place. That is an amazing thing to understand. All right? Prophecy number 13 fulfilled. Therefore, he then delivered him up, that is, Pilate, delivered Christ, to them so that they he might be crucified. Now they took Jesus and led him away, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called a skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha, where they crucified him with two others, one on this side, one on the other side, and Jesus in the middle. Now Pilate also wrote a title and put it on the cross and it was written, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. Now, that's not quite half of them yet. So we will cover number 14, and then we'll take a break. Prophecy number 14. Isaiah had prophesied he was numbered among the lawbreakers, okay? Prophesied. He was counted among the transgressors, Isaiah 53, verse 12. Fulfilled. And also two other malefactors were led away with him to be put to death. And when they came to the place called Skull, there they crucified him with the malefactors, one on the right and the other on the left, Luke 23, verses 32 and 33. Look at the details of all of these things, see? Okay? So there we have 14 of the 28 prophecies that were fulfilled just before, on, or just after the Passover day. So let's go ahead and take a break, and we'll come back 
and look at the other 14 prophecies that occurred. Now let's continue on with Sabbath services, the Sabbath before Passover. And as we have mentioned before, this year, the Passover is on April 5th, which means we take Passover on the night of the 4th, but April 5th was the same day in 30 AD that Jesus was crucified. So think of that, not quite 2,000 years, but to the very day. So let's keep that in mind as we go through all of these things. Now, let's pick it up, continuing with the 28 prophecies fulfilled on the Passover day, some just before and some just after. But nevertheless, all the details of all of these prophecies were fulfilled absolutely word for word. So just think of what that does in bringing the veracity of the Bible and the truthfulness of the Bible that down through all that time, down to that one day, everything fulfilled in minute detail. And of course, all of those involved did not understand that. But then God revealed it to them after it had taken place. So let's come to prophecy number 15, where David prophesied that his hands and feet that is, Jesus' hands and feet would be pierced. And I've often wondered what David thought when he wrote this down. Let's read it. Prophesied. Dogs have surrounded me. Sound like all the group around the crucifixion site. A band of evildoers have encircled me, they have pierced my hands and my feet. Psalm 22, verse 16. Now that's quite a thing. Okay. Fulfilled. And they crucified him. Mark 15, 25. Then the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. Now this is after the Passover. And he said to them, if I did not see Thomas, that, yeah, Thomas was there. If I do not see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger in, in the nail marks and put my hand in his side, because we'll see the prophecy, a soldier thrust a spear into his side, apparently from the right hand side up into piercing his heart to make sure that every drop of blood would be spilled and that he would die on that day in that way as was prophesied, okay? So Thomas said, if I can't do this, I will not believe at all. Now, eight after eight days, his disciples, when the disciples were within, Thomas with them, and after the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said, see, because he's a spirit being, he can walk through walls, doors, whatever, okay? And said, peace be to you. Then he said to Thomas, bring your finger and see my hand. Bring forth your hand and put it in my side and be not unbelieving, but believing. John 20, verses 25 through 27. Now that's quite a thing, isn't it? Yes. 
Now, prophecy number 16, the parting of his garments was also prophesied by David. Prophesied. They divided my garments among them and cast lots on my vesture. Now, the vesture was a one woven piece, and they didn't want to cut that up in pieces between the four soldiers out there, so they cast lots. So both of these, fulfilled by the Roman soldiers who do nothing about the scriptures. See? So God is able to make the things be fulfilled to the very absolute final degree. And those who did it knew nothing about the prophecies. The soldiers didn't say, well, I read in the Old Testament that they cast lots, divided his garments. So let's do that. Let's us as soldiers, Roman soldiers, fulfill what's in the Hebrew Bible. Nonsense. So here's the fulfillment. Then they said to one another, let us not tear it, but let us cast lots for it uh, to determine whose it shall be, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. That's what the apostle John wrote, see? Which says, they divided my garments among them, and they cast lots for my vesture. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. Okay. Now, how many things have we done to fulfill prophecies that we didn't know anything about? Is not answering the call of God calling us to his truth and fulfilling a prophecy that we didn't know that we're fulfilling prophecy when we do it because God is the one who leads us to do it. That's an amazing thing. And remember, it is God who gives repentance and it is God who leads us to repentance. It is God who forgives our sins through the sacrifice of Christ and his shed blood which he shed on the Passover day. All right, let's continue on. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. Now, prophecy number 17. In another psalm, David prophesied that they would give him vinegar to drink. All right. Again, these were the Roman soldiers there standing in the crucifixion area. They're the ones who carried it out. They're the ones who nailed his hands and his feet. They're the ones who lifted him up on the cross. Okay. Prophesied. They also gave me gall for my food, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Psalm 69, 21. Fulfilled. They gave him vinegar mingled with gall to drink, but after tasting it, he would not drink, Matthew 27, 34. Okay. So that's quite a thing. Down to that small thing about the vinegar and the gall. Prophecy number 18. See, now all of these amount to substantial facts which prove the Bible true. Old Testament and New Testament. Prophecy number 18. David also prophesied that many would be watching Jesus during the crucifixion and his suffering. Okay? Now, prophesied. They look and gloat over me, Psalm 22, verse 17. Fulfilled. And the guards sat down there to guard him, Matthew 27, 36. And all the people who gathered together to this site, after seeing these things take place, they beat their breast and returned. Okay. And they were gloating over it. Amazing thing. Now think about 
all of these things transpiring, and not one of them knew they were fulfilling prophecy. Probably very few even had anything to understand that this was coming from God. And even the disciples didn't understand it until afterwards when Christ had opened up their minds to everything that would happen to the Christ in, in the law of the Psalms and the, and the prophets. You find out in Luke 24, okay? Now, prophecy number 19. Among those watching would be Jesus' family and friends who would stand at a distance, prophesied. My loved ones and my friends stand apart from my plague, that is his wounds. And my neighbors stand far off, Psalm 38, verse 11, fulfilled. Now all those who knew him stood afar off observing these things, the women also who followed him from Galilee, Luke 23, verse 49. Amazing, isn't that, huh? Think about that. Now, brethren, let's understand something. Whenever we come for Sabbath services, we're fulfilling some kind of prophecy. Whenever we love and obey God, we're fulfilling prophecy. Ever think of it that way? And God is fulfilling prophecy back to us by giving us understanding, by blessing us, by protecting us, by leading us, and even by having carnal men and women who know nothing about God do things which facilitate what we need to do to serve God. Amazing. Prophecy number 20. Some of his observers would shake their heads at him. All right, let's read it, prophesied. And I also became a reproach to them when they looked upon me. They shook their heads, Psalm 109, verse 25. Fulfilled. But those who were passing by railed at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourselves. Okay. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Matthew 27, verses 39 and 40. Amazing. See? That re reminds me of Satan telling Jesus, if you are the son of God, command that these stones be it turned into bread, see. Very similar. Prophecy number 21. Even the words of his reproachers were prophesied by David. Let's read it. And those who were doing it didn't even know that they were fulfilling prophecy. But here it is, prophesied. He trusted on the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, since he delighted in him, Psalm 22 and verse 8. Fulfilled. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said... I am the son of God. And the two robbers who were also crucified with him reproached him with the same words, Matthew 27, verses 43 and 44. Imagine that. You talk about a day that was absolutely filled with fulfilling prophecy and the angels causing the thing, these things to happen, the demons who were there attacking, and I imagine those who were reproaching, the demons were right behind, their ins right behind them, inspiring them to do it. All right? Prophecy number 22. 
Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would make intercession for sinners. This intercession began even during his crucifixion. Prophesied. Okay. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for transgressors. Isaiah 53, 12. Now fulfilled. Let's read it. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. First words he said when he was hung on a cross. For they do not understand what they are doing. No, they don't know. They didn't know they were fulfilling prophecy. And he divided his garments and cast lots, Luke 23, verse 34. Okay. Now here again, here again, we have some words of David for the next prophecy. And when you read all of Psalm 22, all the way through, verse after verse, it makes you wonder, what did David think? when he spoke these words and when he wrote these words. Quite an amazing thing. See, so we need to understand how absolutely amazing the word of God is. And this is why it's so important that we handle it truthfully, righteously, in the right way, and use it the way God wants it used. These are the things that he inspired to be. Okay? So here it is. Prophecy 22 fulfilled. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not understand what they are doing. And he divided his garments and cast lots. Luke 23, verse 34. Okay? Prophecy number 23. David prophesied the thoughts of Jesus at the height of his suffering. Let's read it. Prophesied. This is also in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me now? And why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Because Jesus had to do this all alone and not sin. Now, there are times when we are in the, the depths of a trial and we wonder, where's God? How's God going to help us? What is he going to do? Well, trust in him. He'll work it out. Let's read the fulfillment of this, okay? In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The very same words that David wrote. Why? The more we go through these and see how all these prophecies were fulfilled in the, the finest detail possible. This ought to give us a whole lot more confidence in the word of God, in the power of God, and what God will do for us and in us and through us, and what he wants us to do. See? That we can continually come to God and have our sins forgiven. We can continually come to God and grow in grace and knowledge. Okay, prophecy number 24. Zechariah prophesied that his body would be pierced with a sword. Prophesied. And they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. Zechariah 12.10. Now that was the Roman soldier. They did that automatically with those that they crucified. Okay the ones they wanted dead before they broke their legs. So this was done, as we will see, with the next prophecy. 
so that there wouldn't be a bone broken in Jesus' body as it was prophesied. Now, you think about everything that Jesus went through, the scourging, the beating, the crucifixion, nailing to the cross, and so forth, and not one bone was broken. Amazing, okay? So here it is, prophecy number 24. Zechariah prophesied that his body would be pierced with a sword, and they that look upon me whom they have pierced fulfilled. But one of the soldiers had pierced his side with a spear, and immediately water and blood came out. Okay. Make sure that every drop of blood was spilled on the ground as the sacrifice for the sin of the world. And think about this. The blood went into the ground, the dust of the ground, right? What are we made of? The dust of the ground. And so this shows that his blood and his sacrifice covers the sin of all of those who repent. Quite an amazing thing, isn't it? Yes. And again, another scripture says, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced, uh, John 19, verses 34 and 37. Okay. Prophecy number 25. Now, I don't know what the odds would be in trying to calculate these things, but I don't think there are any odds that could measure the fulfilling of these scriptures compared to the prophecies that were given. Prophecy number 25, David prophesied that Jesus would commit his spirit to God. Prophesied. Into your hand I commend my spirit, Psalm 31, 5. Fulfilled. And after crying out with a loud voice, Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said these things, he expired, Luke 23, verse 46. Down to his last breath. Prophecy number 26. David also prophesied the last words of Jesus. Prophesied that he has done this, Psalm 22, 3. The Hebrew literally reads, for it is finished, fulfilled. Therefore, when Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. Quite a statement. And after bowing his head, he yielded up his spirit, John 19 and verse 30. Okay. So Jesus gave his life. And when he yielded up the spirit to God the Father, the only thing that was left was the body of Jesus Christ, which was to not see any corruption indeed. Okay? Prophecy number 27. As no bone of the Passover lamb was to be broken, Exodus 12, 46, not a bone of his would be broken. Prophesied. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken, Psalm 34, 20. Now, when you take all the Psalms that David did that had prophecies, of what Jesus would go through. That makes you wonder, what did David think after he wrote those down? Quite a thing indeed. Okay. So let's read it. Fulfilled. 
Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first one and the legs of the other one who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead and they did not break his legs. For those things took place so that, John writes, the scripture might be fulfilled, not a bone of him shall be broken. John 19, verses 32 and 33 and 36. All on that one day, all of these details being fulfilled, okay? Now, prophecy number 28. So you look at this, that seven times four is 28, okay? Or two times 14 is 28. Prophecy number 28. Let's read it. And his burial in the tomb of a rich man was foretold by Isaiah, prophesied. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away with his generation who did consider that he was cut off out of the hand of the living for the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, although he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, Isaiah 53, verses 8 and 9. Quite an amazing thing. Think about that, okay? And then he had to be in the grave three days and three nights and then be resurrected, okay? Now we'll talk about that a little later. Fulfilled. And when evening was coming on, a rich man of Arimathea came named Joseph, who was himself a disciple of Jesus. And after going to Pilate, he begged to have the body of Jesus. Jesus would have otherwise been buried among the criminals. See? Now, what caused Joseph of Arimathea to go ask for the body of Jesus? the Spirit of God, or an angel of God. Then Pilate commanded that the body be given over to him, and after taking the body, Joseph wrapped it in clean linen cloth and placed it in a new tomb which he had hewn in the rock. And after rolling a great stone to the door of the tomb, he went away. Matthew 27 verses 57 through 60, okay? Quite a thing. Think of that. The greatest death in the history of the world on the Passover day. And that's why, brethren, we keep the Passover the way that Jesus said. We don't do it like fake Christianity of the world and take a Lord's Supper anytime we want to. Because the Passover is the commemoration of the death of Jesus Christ. God manifested in the flesh so that his perfect sacrifice would cover the sins of all human beings and in his plans, past, present, and future, as the plan of God is being worked out in God's way in everything. So understanding all these prophecies, look at how they were carried out and how they were brought to pass and how God made sure that it fulfilled his will. This needs to give us great faith and great understanding in the sacrifice of Christ, in his death, in his resurrection, in all the prophecies in the Bible, of all the words that are in the Bible, that they are true, that they are from God, that they are for us. Okay? So, let's finalize it this way. All these prophecies were fulfilled 
by the suffering, death, and burial of Jesus Christ on a Passover day. Okay? There it is. And like Jesus said just before he died, it is finished. That doesn't mean there isn't more work to do. That phase of God's plan was finished. But it was meant to be spread out for all those who come to Christ. And that's how great the Passover day was and is and will always continue to be. Thank you.